Hi everyone, I'm Doug Melia. Welcome to the Same Kit, Different Day podcast. I've got a special guest with me today, Tony Bleakman. Tony, how are you doing? We are good. Surviving lockdown. Excellent. That's all. That's what we need to know. And you, you, business as usual for you. You've been in the hospitals and around and about. Well, for my sins, I remain a consultant in emergency medicine. Um, but fortunately, I'm self-employed, so I pick and choose when I want to work. But I have been um, working uh, in hospitals uh, over the, the last couple of months, yes. Excellent. Good. And we, we have obviously had involvement because of medical reviews you've done, and I've seen you speak at a few conferences. So I know a little bit about your background. If you wouldn't mind telling our listeners a little bit about sort of how you got involved with the use of force world. Yeah, it's, it's been a, a unique and very exciting journey, and it started probably almost 30 years ago now. Um, I am a doctor, and I specialised in surgery, then uh, I moved into emergency medicine. And I started getting involved with some uh, very uh, early use of force reviews for the police, um, without much specialist knowledge, although I have a little bit of a military background. And one day I got a, a phone call from a very angry police trainer and his name was Peter Boatman. And he said, why are you getting involved passing opinion on use of force that my officers use on the streets because you know nothing about it? And he said to me, you have a choice to make, my friend. You can either continue doing what you're doing in an uninformed way and I'll shoot you down in public or take three weeks off work and come and train with me and then we'll talk about use of force. And I was young enough and stupid enough to accept the <laughs> offer and I took three weeks off work and I spent three weeks in a training facility with the late Mr. Peter Boatman, a police trainer. And I left that process holding certificates saying that I was an instructor in police unarmed defensive tactics. And I was able to help the police with use of force issues coming from a slightly more informed background. And that evolved into um, use of force arenas outside the police. And so I underwent training yeah. in um, skills using mental health facilities and other, other environments where use of force is, is, is a necessity or a requirement. And I was able to combine some medical knowledge with my growing knowledge of the use of skills and that's and latterly restraint equipment and that led to my involvement with NICE which is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence looking at use of um, <clears throat> controls uh, controlling um, disturbed individuals in mental health institutions and combining medicine with use of force and restraints and I was able to develop an area of expertise in the field and I've been able to help um, uh, people and trainers and policy makers across a wide spectrum of organizations. And latterly, you and I have done some good work on looking at safer ways of physical restraints, mechanical restraints. Yes, yeah, and moving people, there's, there isn't a system sort of, I don't, I haven't seen you have a look at and, and scrutinize. So I've always really respected your opinion on this. And you were the first person I thought of when I put the TV on and I saw an image of somebody kneeling on somebody's neck. Now, the George Floyd case, we I know there's some autopsy results come out and I know they're sort of, some of them are conflicting. The family have done a private one. Um, we all know not to kneel on somebody's neck. I, even if a sort of, I, I was with my friend, my friend the other day, and his five-year-old said, "You, you don't do that." So I think the, the the issue of not kneeling on someone's neck, we we get that. But why why medically is that so dangerous? Why medically let, let, is that so dangerous? Let, let's break that down because there's an, there's an element of um, ignorance um, yes. coming out of, of this issue. When you put pressure on a person's neck there are one of several mechanisms there are several mechanisms that can lead to death there's the obvious one which is you choke them that is you shut off you close off their airway so they cannot breathe uh, strangulation if you will and that element of it we will see them straining against it and we'll see little what's called petechial hemorrhages and flushed skin and they, that may or may not be present when you put pressure on the neck because there are other ways of causing death by putting pressure on the neck. 
you can choke off the blood supply to the brain by pressure on the carotid arteries. But the one that is often forgotten and comes up from time to time in coroner's courts is vagal nerve pressure. The vagus nerve runs either side of the carotid artery in the neck. And if you put pressure on it, you can stimulate it. And the vagus nerve, amongst many other things, will slow down the heart. So that if you have pressure across the vagus nerves for more than a few minutes, that is one mechanism that can cause death without the obvious findings of strangulation that they were looking for at post-mortem. Very often in these cases, it's a combination of all three things, pressure on the airway, pressure on the carotid arteries, choking off blood supply to the brain, combined with pressure on the vagus nerves, which slows the heart down. The, the tragic thing about this case is there's two tragic things from my perspective. The tragic thing is that this was, there is no defense However, however they try and dress it up in court, there cannot be a defense for putting your knee on a man who's saying, I cannot breathe, get off me, I cannot yep. breathe, when he's not fighting and he's handcuffed. There cannot be a defense for doing that. No. The way you look at it, on any moral, legal, or medical level, and I don't care how good a defense lawyer they get, that's not defensible, in my humble opinion. The other thing to say is that I think that tragic video and needs to become needs to become part of any training program on use of force that needs yes. to be and why because it says something that you and i have been discussing for years which is because someone says i can't breathe you know that that that, that means well you know some people would say well if he's talking he can clearly breathe so let's keep on doing what we're doing that's it, it is the most stark example I've ever seen of someone dying saying, I can't breathe, get off me, I'm dying. And it relates to the combined mechanism of pressure on his neck and probably an element of positional asphyxia. He's lying on his front, he can't fully inflate his chest, but someone's yeah. kneeling on it. And over a course of several minutes, he develops a progressive oxygen deficit, enough to perfuse his brain to say, I can't breathe, get off me, but he's dying. Yeah. And I think we need to, that that piece of video must become part of training across any sector that's using use of force. The other thing that worries me is not so much the medical issue. It's there's something about the look in that police officer's eyes and the yes, guy that's standing in front of him. Son, son, and the guy standing in front of him. I get the impression that in American policing culture, the public are viewed as the enemy, as your as, yeah. as your potential assassin. And I am, I think we are blessed in the UK that policing is done by consent and it's done, it's done for the public, not against the public. And I think there's, there's a huge thing. And there's an element of uh, malice in the eyes of those police officers that, that were involved in George Floyd's death. There is, they're not, they don't care. They're not interested. No. This is, this is a man and he's being restrained and they can justify it and do whatever the hell they want to do. Um, they went too far and they killed him and they need, they, they need, they need to be judged in, in a court of law. Um, so it's not just the medical issue that troubles me. It's the, it's the approach and it's the attitude of those police officers. And I think it's awful. And I think we are blessed in this country by having, uh, such an enlightened look through people like yourself and people that look at training, people that look at the safety of restraints, we have an enlightened look and we do the very best we can to minimize risk. And that's perhaps where I can help people like you who are dealing with providing equipment and providing training to people who actually have to do the job. Let's make it as safe as we possibly can. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's so important that this is used because there's just so many warning signs. You've got the panicked, panic stricken look on his face. You've got him screaming that he can't breathe. He also complains, you know, he complains about other pains. He complains about stump, stomach pains during the intervention. What, what could that be a sign of? I just get the impression that we could only see the police officer's left knee, which was kneeling on yes. his neck. I suspect I need to, you know, I haven't examined it forensically. I suspect that we might see the officer's right knee over uh, George Floyd's back or abdomen. He's being, he's being squashed onto the ground. He's handcuffed. He's in, in a prone position. Um, his airway is compromised. He's got pressure across his vagus nerves and carotid arteries. He's begging for his life. You've got passers-by begging for his life. I suspect yes. 
the sensation of pain in his belly is the fact that he can't move his diaphragm to breathe adequately. He's, yes. He's struggling. And we, it is the most stark example of uh, a combination of positional asphyxia and uh, pressure on the neck. It couldn't be any worse. Um, but as I say, if it was an error, if it was, you know, through ignorance or poor training, that's one thing. Yes. But to me, it's, it's, it's just appalling practice. And there's an element of, I don't care, you're, you're, you know, we're doing what we can, we're yeah. doing what we do because we can do it. And it's, it, that's, it's, it's the most troubling thing. And then, of course, it gets complicated because you have uh, all the rioting sparked by this. But, the, you know, it, there, there's other undertones as well. And it, 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 the whole thing is ugly and horrible. Yeah, I agree. It's, I, I like the comparison you draw between the UK and, and the US as well. British police officers are held to account. That I, I don't think there's an officer that thinks he is above the law, and I don't think there's an officer that's not scared of a tribunal. I think they don't want to go to court, whereas there's so many case studies for us in the States showing where things like this have happened. Or I mean, in the case of Eric Garner, if you, you've obviously remembered the case of Eric Garner where I think it was selling tobacco with no excise on it. So the, it was it, like the forgery issue. It's not a life or death. And I like what you said about it's not an accident. If somebody falls on someone or during a struggle where they fear for their lives, they have to step outside of that continuum, there's a justification for it. But if somebody's cuffed, held down, um, or in that case, choked, I mean, Eric Garner was was choked. He had the arm around the throat. Um, aside from cutting off the circulation, what effects does cutting the gas off have to the body? Uh, the the, the chokehold, um, as I said, um, it can shut off, shut off the blood supply to the brain and make you fall unconscious and eventually kill you. But in addition to that, um, it's pressure on the vagus nerve that, that, that causes damage. And we see that, I mean, I do a fair amount of expert witness court, uh, work with the courts, and this comes up from time to time in, in uh, strangulation, that it, you don't often, don't always see the typical signs of strangulation. But, and yeah. people die with a neck hold, and that neck hold is often the death is often attributed in court to pressure on the vagus nerves, which slows down the heart to the, to the extent where it doesn't function anymore, and you die that way. Usually, it's a combination of factors that that, that, that kill the victim. In this particular case, I think you've got a guy kneeling on his back, yeah. progressive position on asphyxia. You've got pressure on his neck. Uh, and he's straining against it. So his airway and his carotid arteries and his vagus nerves are all compromised. If you keep that going for eight and a half minutes, you're going to kill someone. He was probably dead five minutes into it. And I think the most the most shocking bit is where they flip his lifeless corpse onto onto his back. And he's dead at that point. He's been dead a couple of minutes. I think it is, it, it is grotesque. And even at that point, I didn't see any panic or, oh my God, what have we done? going on no. it was almost matter of fact and that to me is almost as bad as what happened it's the attitude of you know okay yeah. so that's how it is and I, I find that very disturbing i think it's a trait it is a trait it, it rapidly becomes um a no justice no peace issue it rapidly becomes about rioting we've then got presidential tweets and things like that but i think it's it's a trait it's a training issue you know maybe we need to have more there should be way more de-escalation training the the way police officers are trained has to be looked at and has to be scrutinized because handcuffs are meant to be there to prevent further injury they're meant to be there so we can get someone under control and then get them into a position and this is always my concern about restraint equipment we don't supply it without training and we make sure that people are trained how to use it because in those circumstances, I think the handcuffs actually added to, to, to the position. They were they were part of the instrument of his death, of George Floyd's death. The, the way he put his arms behind the back, would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. But I think there's, there's a more fundamental thing here. Um, before we start dealing with, you know, clearly you and I have got no influence on training of American police officers, although it would, it would be nice to get some sort of um, input yeah. there. The... I think it's, and I've, I've been to two conferences in Las Vegas, policing conferences, and it's very much a culture issue. And I think before we start dealing with training, we need to deal with culture. Yeah. My subjective view has been that American police look at every traffic stop as your potential assassin, and therefore yes. you have 
unclip your gun holster, you have, you're ready to draw your weapon, and it's all about this man is going to represent a threat to your life and until proven otherwise. Whereas, fortunately, in the UK, no, it's a traffic stop. You police officers are trained to look for signs of a possible threat and to react accordingly. Keep distance, call for help, and so on and so forth. But um, I think when we start dealing, when, if we deal with this properly, we need to go back to the culture of policing. Way before we talk about training, yes. you and I know and know people um, to, uh, that deliver appropriate training for the environment. Yeah. The American approach is very uh, gung ho, very macho, very confrontational, very aggressive. Every traffic stop is your potential assassin. And therefore, we're going to go into that situation with our guns unholstered and ready to ready to escalate at the and so on, um, with, with, with catastrophic results sometimes. So I think to deal with this problem, the Americans need to challenge the culture of policing. And then, of course, and then, of course, yeah, absolutely. Um, once we look at that, then it's time to look at the training. And I, I find it difficult to believe that those officers had no training in the dangers of uh, prolonged restraints on the ground. I, I don't. I'm not familiar with their training package, but I would be surprised if it wasn't covered. Yes. Yeah. Or the dangers. There should be some element of positional asphyxia within within any any training system. I do notice it's commonplace to cuff to the rear quite often. Um, cuffing to the rear as opposed to cuffing to the front medically differences advantages. Um, it, a lot of it depends on the size of the individual. Um, yeah. In certain situations, if someone is standing up with a hand behind the back that will encourage the chest to inflate fully and it may actually be beneficial in certain very large individuals handcuffing to the front may restrict that movement to a degree in most individuals i don't think it makes a huge amount of difference no okay that's interesting and then what about when you get into a prone position so a prone position in itself i understand the abdominal contents compress on the diaphragm how much is that exasperate exasperated if i can get the word right by being cuffed to the rear it may restrict movement some more, but the, this, this prone strength thing has been problematic for quite some time. Yes. Um, some of the high profile deaths during restraints occurred in the prone position, which led to a fairly knee jerk reaction. Prone restraint is bad and you're going to die if we put you in a prone restraint. And some places, I think the Welsh Assembly put a ban on it, and other places said no more than three minutes, which was yep. locked out of thin air. Um, the answer is. Um, is complex. Prone restraints can be safe. They can be safe. Um, and there are certain techniques that I'm familiar with where you're almost in a recovery position, which is, yes. is, is quite good. You're taking pressure off the belly. They're not lying completely prone. They're slightly on their side. They're able to inflate their chest. You're able to look at them and look at their breathing and talk to them and, and calm them down. You can do all of that in, a, in, in some prone conditions and you know currently with we're, we're, we're dealing with this covid crisis and one of the things therapeutically that we're doing to make people better yeah. is to put non-invasive non-invasive ventilation on patients who are in the prone position why because in the prone position you are able if it's done properly to yeah. recruit more lung tissue to help you breathe when your lungs are damaged so it's not a black and white prone restraint kills no. you and supine restraint is going to be amazing all the time. The answer is complex. So to put a blanket ban on prone restraint, no, I'm, I'm against that. Is there a role yep. for prone restraint? 100%. Yes. Um, can it be managed safely? 100%. Um, you have to know what you're doing. This is where we get into the complexities of training, and it depends yep. on your on your sub, on, on who you are restraining and who's doing the restraining, and what the, what and, and and the level of training that goes with it. So. Putting your, if you're prone on your belly and you're fatigued and you're trying to correct your oxygen deficit by breathing fast, any pressure on the belly, restricting the diaphragmatic movement is bad. Yeah. Putting someone in the recovery position, well, we teach that in first aid when someone's unconscious, we teach, and that, but they're still breathing, we teach first aiders to put them in the recovery position, which is a semi-prone position. Why? Yeah. Because they can breathe and you can watch them. So yeah. that principle applies to restraints as well, uh, a semi-prone position. There's nothing wrong with a prone position, uh, um, provided it is, it is done 
uh, carefully uh, yes. and monitored, and it's de-escalated at the earliest possible opportunity. One thing we saw these police officers do in Minneapolis was fail to de-escalate. I can understand maybe that this was a big man and maybe the circumstances of the arrest scared the police officers, but they got him handcuffed. They got him on the ground. Now what? What's the yes. plan now? He wasn't resisting. He wasn't fighting. He said, get off me, I can't breathe. They kept it going for eight minutes and 40 seconds until he was a corpse. Yeah. Um, what was the de-escalation plan? And surely in any use of force training that I'm familiar with, there's a bit that says the de escalated the earliest possible opportunity as soon as yeah. safe. That didn't happen. What were they waiting for? Were they waiting for him to die? Were they, I, I, don't, I don't quite understand what the issue is. Um, and as I say, I hope and believe that George Floyd's legacy will be to make say, uh, training safer globally. And yeah. I feel so motivated by that case that I will certainly be recommending to, to all the organizations that I work with that that should become part of day one training. This is what happens when it goes wrong and when your attitude stinks. Yes. I think some of the incidents I've seen in the UK and, and overseas, um, I've looked at it and I've thought, this isn't a training issue. This is a staff recruitment issue. When I've watched the undercover videos of them talking to people, I'm like, that that you could teach that person whatever techniques you want. And they're going to step outside of it. And I think you're dead right. I think if we showed the videos of Eric Garner and we showed the videos of George Floyd and we showed the videos of David Dungy and the other deaths from across the world, and see what people's responses are like. And I know that some, some quite high profile people have said, if you're with this or you think there's anything right about this video, then you hand your badge in, you hand your gun in because you shouldn't have a place on this force. And I think, yeah, use it to gauge people's responses. Maybe without, even before they've had any training, say to them, have a look at this video. What do you think? Everybody should think it stinks, shouldn't they, moving forward? Yeah, I think the issue, and as I say, it was, uh, I first went to a, a policing conference in Vegas probably 25 years ago, and I was... I mean, you get an impression watching watching TV what American cops are like. We're actually in a room with a thousand of them, and each presentation is uh, people talking in such terms that are very alien to, to someone from the UK. That yeah. every car stops a threat to your life. Every person you talk to in the street is a, is a threat to your life, and you treat them as such. And there's you know there's that recent case where they. They toss a coin to work out what they're going to do with this this car stop. They're going to arrest him, or are they going to let him go? They toss a coin, and it's funny. It's not funny. No, it's not. It's not funny. If someone needs to be arrested lawfully, fine, go ahead and do it safely. If someone doesn't need to be arrested, you know, we're going to decide that on the toss of a coin in a police no. car. That's wrong. That is wrong. So I think the biggest challenge is not so much well, clearly it is the training and, and, and delivery of that training operationally. We need to go one step back and start looking at the, the culture of, of, of policing. I think they see themselves as heroes. They put their lives on the line every time they go out to work. I get yeah. all of that. It can be a dangerous environment. Of course, it can be a dangerous environment. Um, but that should not, in my humble opinion, make you want to be a robocop, go out there, you know, treating everybody as a, as a threat to your life and draw your gun or be ready to draw your gun. It's wrong. It's just not right. No. The, the incidents like this, they shine a light on restraint. I like how we all come together and talk about things like this, and there's always common ground. There's some things we don't agree on, but the, the, this is common ground. What it will do, though, is it will spark up the, the discussion about restraint being bad. Um, and this, you know, we've got restraint reduction on our minds all the time. But I've heard about people banning, we need to ban restraint. I've heard people banning about saying things like ban seclusion. And my answer to that is be careful what you wish for, because if you ban the act of containing a child in a room, let's say in a school, for example, uh, the only other option you've got is to restrain them and you're going to have to hold them and restrain them. So it's interesting you say about this prone thing because there, there never was a ban it was just a lot of people including government ministers that sort of got the wrong angle on it and um, what are your views then on on mechanical restraint soft restraints equ equipment for restraining people because the same as prone and the same as pain which we'll get to in a bit um the things that people don't like my my approach to this is to seek the least restrictive and the least yeah. unpleasant intervention for any situation. But that doesn't say, that doesn't mean that 
you're never going to restrain or use mechanical restraints or you use drugs or you use handcuffs or you use uh, less lethal weapons. It depends on, on the environment and what you're facing with. And my, my take on this, and I do this for, for, for an MOD advisory group as well, is looking for the least bad way of doing things. And some yeah. things are unpleasant. Nobody wants to go to work and restrain a youngster. Nobody wants to go to work and put someone in a mechanical restraint. Nobody wants to go to work, hold someone down and inject them with powerful drugs. No one wants to do it. No. And as you say, if they want to do it, then they're in the wrong job. It's an unnecessary evil. And working, even working in an emergency department, probably about once a month, I face that situation where what is the least bad thing to do? Somebody who is off their head with drugs, who's physiologically in a terrible state and is unmanageable, and there are seven cops dragging them off the back of a police van into the emergency department. What are we going to do with it? You know, we need to minimize risk to all parties. And sometimes that requires rapid physical control to terminate the violence. And that may yes. require in, that may require restraint devices or handcuffs. It may require um, restraints on the ground. It may restri- require drugs. It may require a less lethal weapon. It depends on the circumstance. I think it is not intelligent to say we're not doing restraints anymore, full stop. We're not doing yes. seclusion anymore, full stop. It is entirely reasonable to say restraint and seclusion are things that we don't want to do, but there are circumstances where it is the least bad thing that we can do and we need to do. And if and it all comes back to looking at your organization. If you identify in your organization the need to control people who are out of control, then we need to sit down and work out what is the least bad way of doing that so we don't hurt people. Yes. Uh, or we minimize any discomfort or any humiliation or any threat to staff or, 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 or persons in our care. So I'm not prepared to go along with no seclusion, no restraints, no mechanical restraints, no chemical restraints. I'm not prepared to do that. What I am prepared to say is let's look at all the options. Let's look at your organization specifically. What 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 is it? What's the threat posed to people in your care? What's the threat posed to staff? And let's work out the least intrusive, the least unpleasant way of preventing injury and preventing death. And sometimes, regrettably sometimes, that may require seclusion, that may require physical restraint, it may require manual restraints on the ground, it may require chemical restraints, it may require high levels of force. But let's look at finding the least unpleasant way of doing it. And in a self-defense situation, that might include the use of pain. Yeah, pain, pain's an interesting one because, again, nobody wants to go to work and uh, cause somebody pain. Now, pain's an interesting one because if we look at the definition of pain, the one that I've got from the medical perspective and something I deal with every day at work is pain is the subjective perception of a noxious stimulus. That's the best That's the best. Um, definition that I've come up with and that we tend to use in medicine. So it's subjective. Yeah. Big pain causes the body to do certain things. It will cause the body to reflexively withdraw. It will uh, stop the it, it'll stop the ability, the, the subject's ability to think about what they're doing because, oh my God, I, I, this is painful. What am I going to do? Something bad is happening. And there are certain populations and there are certain situations in which you know what? A short application of pain may terminate something far more serious. If somebody was strangling somebody else, and I yeah. couldn't, I could not, which is a threat to life, and I could not find of a quicker way of dealing with it in an emergency situation, I would be able to uh, accept a short application of pain to prevent somebody else's death. Yeah, it sounds extreme. But in those extreme circumstances, if there is no other way of terminating that strangulation attempt now, because it needs to happen now, then yeah, I would I would support that. Yeah. So, and again, it's a bit like the prone restraint. Let's have a blanket ban. No, let's not have a blanket ban. Let's say that it is something that we don't want to use, but we recognize that in certain extreme risk situations, it is the lesser evil. And if it yeah. saves a life, then I would support it. Perfect. And my concern is that if you do take away some of these restrictive holds, um, the use of mechanical restraint or drugs might go up. 
because if we can't control someone, we're going to seek to use other other options and other avenues. And for me, especially with young people, if we think that certain approaches can't be used, um, you get people saying, well, we can't control them. And from that, you end up with, well, it's not safe to take them out of the room. And you end up with people in long term segregation. And by locking people up and hoping they get better, we've seen that that doesn't really help. No, it doesn't help at all. But the this is where it goes wrong. It, all it takes is one staff member to use a pain technique inappropriately for the, everything to come crashing down. It is at the extreme end of behavior management, the extreme end where we have to do something to save a life. The moment that becomes diluted and becomes used as a, a come along tool, let's get you out of the room now thing, then that becomes, in my opinion, wrong. We should not yes. be using it for education for teaching them a lesson for behavior management we should reserve it for the extreme upper end top end of threat to life and nothing yeah. else is my view yeah. i agree tony it's been great talking to you and some really great stuff for our listeners there anything else planned for the day um i'm actually doing some use of force work on the ligature minimizing risk on ligatures in certain that one institution has got a problem with young persons in care so again it's adopting the principles of you know a, a ligature around the neck in a young person is, is quite a high risk situation yes yeah yeah best tools that we can give staff to terminate that behavior and that's the challenge i'll be working on today excellent interesting stuff well you enjoy your day i'll speak to you soon tony all the best thanks doug Peace out. bye